Well, it was both. Um, it was a bit sad to leave Bayreuth after 12 successful years there, and I, I felt quite comfortable in Bayreuth. But at the same time, it was like starting a new adventure here in Bonn. And, and I'm, as a geographer, I'm always up for adventures. So it's something new. It's not really coming back because 12 years was a long time in Bayreuth, and it's more like starting something new. And that's what I'm up for. Well, the diversity of topics may, may look like as if I was covering um, too many dispersed um, topics, yes. But I think you, you have to see that it's not the, um, the material objects that really um, are essential in the research, but rather uh, the concepts that I apply for my research. And these concepts are pretty much focused. So what I'm interested in is how uh, people in different developmental settings uh, cope with changing environments, um, how they try to negotiate change, and how they try to make sense of what we call development. So the underlying questions in East Africa and in Korea are basically the same, although, although the objects are different. And what I gain from, um, from this diversity of regional and topical um, interest is that, that I, I'm able to make comparisons and to learn from the differences and the similarities that we discover both in Korea and in East Africa and see what we can learn out of, out of similarities and differences. Well, that was more um, to entertain my students because it's, it's easier to do research in Germany than to do it uh, in Africa. Um, I would like to do more in Germany because I believe that uh, increasingly um, uh, we, we should get beyond this division of the world into a part of the world that is called the Global South or the developing world and then the rest of the world, but rather uh, the uh, the uh, theoretical approaches that we use should be applicable both in Africa and in Germany. And for that for that reason, I would like to to intensify my scientific activities here in Germany in order to test my research approaches. The term uh, risk scape is, is coined in, uh, as an analogy to landscape in a similar way as Arjun Apadurai uh, uses um, the idea of scapes um, in, in terms of media scapes or ethnoscapes, for example. Um, and what I find interesting in this idea of risk scapes are two, basically two um, um, key ideas. One is that uh, uh, risk scapes such as landscapes combine a materiality of a physical landscape, a physical landscape um, of risk, and at the same time, uh, the view of of the people, the people who who uh, perceive a landscape and and who may find it pretty or or uh, dangerous or whatever. So it's it's this combination of materiality and the subjective perspective of the people who live in and move through a landscape that constitutes a risk scape. And secondly, um, the, uh, I'm using the concept of risk scape as a way of visualization of um, risk perspectives. So the risk scape is something like a mental map of a risky territory through which people find a way. Uh, avoiding risk, but at the same time taking particular risk. You simply cannot live without risks. And in that way, um, the risk scape is a concept that combines different perspectives and makes it possible to, to put the spatial dimension of risk um, in the center of my research. Well, indeed I do, in, 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 
the, in some respects. If you look at um, Beck's um, hypothesis of the world risk society, it, it basically has two main arguments. One argument is that um, in, uh, under the conditions of the world risk society, it is no longer um, the impact of disasters as such that have an effect on, on policy, but uh, the anticipation of disasters. And Beck uses three examples in, in his book about the World Risk Society. Climate change, terrorism, and the financial cri crisis. So his argument is that the anticipation of these three disasters is politically more influential than the disaster itself. I think he's partly wrong. Um, and this is understandable out of the time when he wrote his book, that was a couple of years ago. What we know by now is that the financial crisis of the euro does have a very strong effect. So it is no longer an anticipation, but it is real. And the same is true for climate change. It is real. And, and we are increasingly experiencing um, the effects of climate change. So I, I wouldn't say that it is uh, primarily the anticipation, but um, the disaster as such is having an effect. And the second argument of, um, of uh, Ulrich Beck is that um, because anticipation is more influential than, than the disaster itself, uh, disasters and the risk of disasters does no longer have a place, but but uh, risk becomes something ubiquitous. It, it's everywhere. I would also say this is only this is partly wrong because a climate change does not have the same effect all over the world. But the the impact of climate change and also the impact of the financial crisis does clearly have a location. And as geographers, we are particularly interested in the way how uh, these. Uh, the localization of these risks becomes real. So for that reason, yes, I'm contradicting uh, Ulrich Beck's hypothesis of world risk society. I uh, still believe in uh, interdisciplinary cooperation, although I have wasted so much time. Um, practicing um, this kind of cooperation. But I have learned from negative experiences. I think the, the major challenge of interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary cooperation, and this is what we have practiced in some of the projects in Bayreuth, is that it's not sufficient to formulate uh, um, research questions out of the perspective of one single discipline but uh, we have to formulate the guiding questions um, in, uh, on the basis of a common understanding between the disciplines. So we have to really study the same questions. Uh, otherwise, um, whatever is called interdisciplinary uh, research is nothing else but the same old stuff of multidisciplinary um, additive uh, cooperation between dis different disciplines who um, um, who exchange data, but who don't really meet at the interesting scientific questions. The argument of interdisciplinarity is often used to convince um, reviewers and, and the funding organizations. So if you go for a big um, social ecological uh, project, it's always on page one, there's something about interdisciplinarity and how, um, how the biologists cooperate with the sociologists and all, all that. Um, but I think we understand now that the real problems are beyond that. And, and um, the, tricky, the tricky questions really have to be addressed um, where, for example, in, in um, a project people really have to work together um, and not only exchange data, but do the research together, for example. <laughs> there is no simple definition, so um, you, you don't expect a one-sentence definition of uh, development because that wouldn't be possible. Um, 
development is increasingly becoming problematic in in scientific contexts and that's partly due to the fact that we are realizing that uh, much of conventional development uh, development studies doesn't really uh, give us um, um, uh, new insights about what is going on in the world so uh, for that reason I would take a pragmatic approach and I would say uh, the term and the definitions of development are good um, in in practice in development practice but for my scientific uh, interests I find it very difficult to use the term development what I'm interested in is how uh, people in different uh, cultural political and economic uh, contexts are negotiating change and how they are trying to direct change um, so that it meets their interests whether you term that uh, development or not doesn't really matter to to what I'm uh, studying um, so this becomes problematic especially when like like in uh, my situation uh, when you have the mandate to teach development studies because I um, I have to search for a justification for what I am doing and what I'm trying to do um, is to sensitize my students for um, for um, the problems of this term development and to open their eyes to, to to a new understanding of the relationships between the global north and the south and the processes that are changing this relationship. So for me it's alright that um, CEF is called the Center for Development uh, Research, um, although some people at CEF may not be happy about the term development. We just have to live uh, with the terminology. Um, but we shouldn't forget that the term as such is problematic and that we have to reflect about its background and we have to avoid the, the baggage that is transported uh, with this term uh, um, without being questioned. From my experience in Bayreuth, I, I would have an easy, a simple answer to begin with, and that is that in our research, especially when we are doing what we just talked about, development research, um, it is, it is self-evident for me that this research has to be done together with people from the Global South and not about them. So um, Africans for me are not objects of research, but they are my partners in my research and and the people I'm working with are especially my PhD students my colleagues in Africa and I have to respect them as uh, not just as juniors but they are my partners without them I wouldn't be able to do my research so, that, so that's the first thing and um, as a consequence I think that uh, my African PhD students and my colleagues they should show up in in the publications uh, they should be here with me. I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to inviting as many as possible um, to Bonn and to work with them both here and and in their home countries. So that's, as I said, that's the the easy answer. Uh, there's another um, aspect that I find very uh, important in that context, um, which does not only refer to. Uh, PhD students from abroad but also to German PhD students and that is that in recent years in Germany we have started a lot of um, structured PhD programs so there is there is I would I would say an abundance of programs for um, PhD programs and PhD students but we do have a bottleneck for people to carry on afterwards so there's a bottleneck for postdocs and I would rather um, see that we that um, we should be more concerned about what or in which way to support people who have finished their PhD in the first years of their postdoc career, and that is something both for Africans or people from from abroad and for German uh, PhD students, where we should concentrate our efforts in the coming years.
with CEF and other um, uh, institutions that that are concerned with the global south. So there's also the German Institute of Development Policy yeah. and some other uh, institutions at the University uh, of Bonn and also Cologne. Um, I'm um, personally I'm I'm very interested to to intensify my contacts with CEF and these other institutes here in Bonn in the field of um, that we just talked about um, the, the, the relationship between development, uh, risk, and some other uh, issues that have something to do with the relationship between nature, society, and culture. And that is my uh, scientific interest that I do also see at CEF. Many people are working about that at CEF, and for that reason I think it's, it's something like a, well, it's, it's natural that uh, we should uh, get closer together between CEF and uh, what we are doing here. I think um, this is not only a potential, but I take it as an obligation. It, I think it is necessary that uh, here in Bonn we make use of, um, of the fact that Bonn is the center of North-South studies and North-South um, political activities in Germany. and. Um, I do see that we really can make something out of that, um, which goes beyond what we do already have. So I'm, I'm happy to be here. Okay, thank you very much.